Hello, St. Lukers, and welcome to a special edition of Your Week with St. Luke's uh, with me, Pastor Melissa, and with Pastor Jen. And we are about to kick off kind of our summer season at St. Luke's. We're going to kick off um, a new worship series. Um, we'll have a couple different ones this summer. Um, but our podcasts, we're going to do some different things. We're going to um, have some special editions. We're going to have a little bit about what we're talking about in worship, um, but it'll it'll look a little bit different this summer. And so we want to kick off the summer um, sort of centering ourselves in who we are because sometimes summer is one of those times where we go off and we do different things and we're in different places um, and this is a really good opportunity to start our summers off uh, by grounding ourselves in who we are as St. Luke's and as St. Lukers. And so um, this next worship series that starts this Sunday uh, is all about our core values as St. Luke's. Now, if you've been around St. Luke's for a long time, you have heard these again and again, and it's good to keep hearing them, right? We usually preach and teach on them every year. Um, if you are a new St. Luker, you may have heard them um, a little bit in Discover St. Luke's or in partnership, um, but this may be new information for you to get to sort of flesh out what it means to be a part of St. Luke's and what our, our values are grounded in. Um, and so um, I'm going to kick it off uh, to give to ask Pastor Jen to give us a little bit of um, background um, on where these values have come from and how they have guided us um, over time and and been able to be part of who we are as St. Luke's. Thanks. So our sermon series is Living Our Superpowers, um, and it's connected to Vacation Bible School, which is all about superheroes and um that our superpowers here at St. Luke's are um, Christ-centered love um, lived out through our um, acceptance, hospitality, community, discipleship, and service. So when I got here 17 years ago, these were our core values. And of course, core values are meant to believe, you know, kind of the, the grounding, you've got your mission statement and vision statement, um, but how will you express them? What are the, what, what, what is a value in terms of behavior and standards for us as a congregation or us as a family? And I think that the church council chose these probably a good 25 years ago. Um, and it was when I read these core values that I realized that I really did want to move to St. Luke's because it was a, um, I was invited to come to St. Luke's. It was a different appointment process than others. Um, and it was really understanding that St. Luke's, that everything we do is, lived out of these behaviors, these ideals, these things that we value, um, that we also value reading out of scripture, um, a reading out of our theology, our Wesleyan theology. Um, and because of that, I felt so very much aligned with St. Luke's, um, that I truly do believe that these are our superpowers. Um, and I love the fact that we're going to talk about them in this way, because I think, for you as a St. Luker, what does it mean for these to be your values in life as well? So not just our, our company <laughs> core values, so to speak, to use a business speak, but what about you as a spokesperson or as our last sermon series says, I am the church. And so I am St. Luke's and I am these core values in my everyday life. These are the superpowers that the Holy Spirit is going to empower to do amazing things through me um, because of them. So that's kind of where they came from, but also sort of what they mean for us. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting to Every organization I think I've been a part of has had a list of core values somewhere, probably a mission statement, a vision statement, list of core values. I find with a lot of churches, a lot of organizations, they live somewhere on a page on a website, and that's really the only place that they live or get talked about. And so um, what I appreciated coming in um, six years ago with St. Luke's was that um, not only were these core values something that uh, that live on the website, that live in um, you know paperwork, but also also are talked about and discussed and get lived out. And um, a lot of St. Lukers, I have been amazed how many St. Lukers can name all of our core values and can talk about them. And so that's kind of what we want to do today is to start, sort of talk through them um, because we know there's a lot of folks who have come and become part of St. Luke's in the last couple of years. And then we all need a refresher um, so that we all can not only, like Pastor Jen said, see them as part of our organization,
permission, but embody them ourselves and take them um, as we lead our lives in all of the different places and spaces. Um, and so, so we, oh, go ahead. What I was going to say is, so when I came here, I was in charge of contemporary worship, but also evangelism. And one of the things that I, I like kind of latched onto were these core values, because I recognized um, that our core values, when we live them out in every aspect of our ministry and our relationship, when we actually put, when we crystallize them into tangible um, actions and living, they are the greatest evangelism tool that we have as St. Lucas, because I think they truly do set us apart um, from how we do ministry, how we understand the Bible, how we understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, and the work of the church. Um, they set us apart, I think, from other um, faith traditions and and churches in our area. And so that's why, uh, to me, when a St. Luker knows them and can embody them, it gives them a witness. Um, it gives them a story to tell um, about why they're involved in St. Luke's and what those, those core values mean. And also it gives the, uh, St. Luke's an in for listening to what people say they're looking for in church and to be able to honestly speak to them and go, Oh, well, what you're looking for is, is exactly is our core values and that's who we are. So yeah, it's a great, it's a great tool for telling your witness, which is what we've been talking about, um, doing that resurrection work since Easter. Yeah. It's funny. I was, I was with a group of St. Lucas today and, um, we were just sort of going around and sharing some different things. And one of them, um, shared that they were talking to, a, a, a their sister in another state and just sort of sharing a little bit about this group that they're a part of. And, and, it, you know, went on to a little bit about what St. Lucas is about. And, um, they said their, their sister goes, what is up with your church? And, and in the best way possible. Right. And, and, and they could just tell there was something in something in the water that was was special and um it was coming through in the way this person was talking about being part of something um and it's just one small group they were really talking about but they could tell that through that there was something bigger um that that was going on with with what it meant to be St. Luke's and that's i think this is exactly what you're talking about Jen is is if if we embody them, then it just comes through in everything we do. And so this other person is, you know, in another state, but is so excited to come and come to worship when they're in town and things like that. And so, um, you know, how often do we hear that too, even here locally? Um, and so being able to know these things, it's not about being able to rattle off a list. It's really something bigger than that. Um, yeah. it's behaviors and they should be the behaviors that we, um, you know, and I think, I think this, I think this sermon series will talk about that is that these should be the behaviors of how we live with one another and live in the world. And, and so you should see behaviors that, um, uh, come out of, if I, if I value acceptance, then I'm going to be more empathetic. I'm going to listen more than I speak. I'm going to, you know, there's behaviors that come with each of these values. So, yeah. Let's so talk about if you are someone who knows our core values, you can probably write them off. Acceptance, hospitality, community, discipleship, and service, right? Those, those for some of us, roll off of our tongue. And we'll get to each of those. But I want to, um, one of the things that sometimes gets left off when we talk about them is the framework for all of them. Um, yes. That all of these are are wrapped up in Christ-centered love. Um, Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about that piece of it? Yeah. I mean, at the center of who we are is Jesus Christ. The the, we've been studying and making sense of the Bible, the unmitigated living word of God. We put Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity first and foremost in all that we do in our theology, in our understanding of ministry and ecclesiology. Um, we believe that the, the scriptures are illuminated by the Holy Spirit, and we read them through also this living word of God, um, who is Jesus Christ and his love. Th the thing that I think the scriptures tell us the value uh, of God that is most understandable is love, period. Like love, just love, <laughs> as we've said before. Um, and so Christ, God's love that gave us Jesus Christ. God incarnate among us, um, the way that Jesus Christ lived, um, all of his teachings, all of his preachings, all of his healings, um, his sermon on the Mount, that was kind of the, the preamble, the, 
the the constitution of this new kingdom of God, this kingdom of love that had that had come in in Christ um, among us, his his sacrificial death, his resurrection, his ascension, and then the gift of the Holy Spirit. All of it is just centered in love, and if love is the framework then every behavior has to come not out of our love, but out of Christ's love, um, which is bigger and, and unconditional and all powerful in ways that our love um, on our own as human beings by ourselves can't have. So it, it is Christ-centered love is the center of all we do. And yeah. everything else is comes off of this platform. Yeah. Yeah. And some sometimes people say, well, why isn't love one of the values? Well, it it's all the values. It is the value. And you can't that's... have the values without <laughs> love. And you can't have the because we use these words in society all the time. You should be more accepting and you should be, you know, we live in community. I've been in lots of lots of schools and sororities and, you know, community, community, community and service and citizenship. And all of those things are in our culture and our zeitgeist and love is too. But mm -hmm. if they're not centered in Christ centered love, that calls right. for a different understanding of each of these values. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's something we talk about so often, particularly in Lent, you know, even in this last series of talking about, you know, what actually does did Jesus show us that love looked like? And it it's not um, all butterflies and rainbows and, you know, everything being easy too. And so Christ-centered love, that that's a really important um, adjective to put with love for us, that it's not, it's not a, um, a hallmark kind of love. Um, it's something that is, is much deeper. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is the love that says, you know, Oh, I accept everyone. And no, this is the love that says, yeah, and you accept your neighbor as mm -hmm. just as you don't accept them as a human being. You accept them as being beloved by God too. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different, that can only come when you, when it is coming from the wellspring of Christ's love at work in you. Right. To be able to say to those, to your enemy, to those who persecute you, you know, that blessed are those, you know, the only way you can get to that is through the wellspring of Christ centered love. Yeah. You're not going to. Yeah. All else will dry up. That's why second John three, um, 16 is actually going to be the scripture for that week. And I can. First John. Me, first John. Yep. Sorry. My bad. That's why I was confused. I was like, there's no three in second John. Um, don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. It begins in 13. Um, everyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that murderers don't have eternal life residing in him. This is how we know love. Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if someone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but refuses to help, how can the love of God dwell in a person like that? Let's not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. So love is, these values are the actions of love yeah. in Christ Jesus. So let's kick it off with our first value, acceptance. Um, we say with acceptance that we recognize and name that Christ's love, again, centered there, um, has no boundaries, that there is no uh, limit, there is no um, red tape, there is nothing that qualifies you or disqualifies anyone from the love of Christ and therefore cannot qualify or disqualify someone for the love for the love of, of us, which is is what acceptance is all about. Um, to be able to say that all, 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 all people are accepted um, by Christ. And because they are accepted by Christ, they are also accepted by us. Which means I accept myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I accept myself as beloved. I accept another person as beloved. I accept the person that I struggle with most. Um, and it's not just accepting them, but, but it's realizing that they have a place in this church, that it's that what we talked about the last sermon series, I am the church and you are the church. Yep. And that if we've got beef with one another, we got to figure that out and we've got to let love 
um, be between us and let the Holy Spirit be between us so that we can be the church together. Yeah. Um, the scripture for that week is going to be about Ruth. We're going to start in the book of Ruth for most of these super um, heroes because there's some amazing superheroes in this. Um, but when Ruth says to Naomi, her, you know, she is the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Naomi's husband's died. Naomi's bre- uh, sons have died. She, it's her and her daughter-in-laws. And she, because she's a widow and has no way to sustain herself, has to go back to her homeland um, and Ruth, who is a foreigner and would be considered an outsider, um, is the one that says to her in Ruth one, we hear this often, um, we hear this often in marriages and wedding ceremonies where you go, I will go where you stay. I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Um, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. That's full acceptance of yeah. Of she's saying, I am literally everything about you, even the the foreign parts to me, your God, everything I am committing and accepting as my own, my own identity. Now I'm going to be with you no matter what. Um, and it's not just accepting so that she can go with Ruth, but, but, or go with Naomi, but so that Naomi accepts her fully too, as, as family, um, to, to be, to die in a foreign land and be buried there was a huge, huge thing. Um, and so there is this acceptance of the fullness of each other as family. Um, and I think that's what we're talking about. And that is a superpower when you can welcome others because of Christ's love and accept them, not just accept them as you're allowed to breathe the air I breathe, (laughs) which I think sometimes acceptance can easily become. But I mean, I accept you as a part of this family that we're a part of, this connection, this community that we're a part of. It's that kind of acceptance. Yeah, it's not tolerance. Yes, that's the word I, I was looking for. That's, you know, I think about this kind of acceptance, you know, and 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 all of these words have different, you know, connotations in different spaces, but for us particularly acceptance um sometimes can be used in a way that means passivity of just like accept it, deal with it, move on. This is is an active work. This is this is us doing something. Um not not just not doing something, right? It is it is us actively letting people know um that they are welcome and affirmed um among us. Um and not not just passively just allowing people to exist among us, right? Um we hear from people who have had experiences at other churches where they've been told they've been accepted and then at a certain point they discover one thing about who they are or what they've done, or whatever it might be, and suddenly they're not accepted anymore. Um, And we, you know, we've had people say, you know, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop here, because you keep saying that I'm accepted. um, And you're showing me that. But the longer that we are able to actively show people that and show ourselves that again, um, then then it's it's something we do. It's not just something that we allow to happen. Sorry. Now, now I will say that we do say around here, all people are accepted, all behavior is not. And by the way, behavior ha- doesn't have to do with your identity of who you are as a person. Right. I mean, behavior that does harm to another person um, mm-hmm. or or, or di- divides or yep. um, is not of love. Any, right. any behavior that is love, that is not centered in Christ-centered love we can't accept because that's not our value and it's not a part of our framework. And so it, we want to stop poor behavior um, because you're not living into who you fully have been accepted by God to be. So it, it it's all connected to one another. So. Yep. There is absolutely no identity or opinion or viewpoint that would not be welcome um, unless it begins to do harm to someone. Um, and then right. that, that when it turns into to harmful action, that's where we we have some conversation around some of the other core values, around what it means to to be in community and to serve one another. Right. right. So, mm-hmm. so this leads directly into our second core value, which is Pastor Jen's favorite um, of hospitality. This is it, this is always an interesting one to talk about because the word hospitality in Central Florida gets used a lot, right? We are the center of the hospitality industry in so many ways. We hear about what it means to be hospitable and and show hospitality and create space for people in in very um, corporate ways. Um, 
but for us, it means something a little bit more. So Jen, you want to tell us about yeah. that? So um, uh, we, we we like to say hospitality is not donuts, coffee and donuts, although that is a form of it. Um, but it's it's deeper than that. It is the uh, the behavior, the action of of the Old Testament word of Chesed, which is God's loving faithfulness in, in spite of us, um, and and prevailing for us and loving others the way God is loving and faithful to us. Um, it is, it is protective. It is looking out for the other. It is not only do you, I'm hospitable and open up a seat next to me, but I stand by you. I stand with you. I stand for you. Sometimes I speak on your behalf or sometimes I'm silent. So your voice is speaking louder than mine. I'm going to be faithful to you and protect you as if you really were my blood kin. Mm -hmm. um, because that is the relationship that God has bound with me. And so therefore I bind it with you. Um, and our superhero for that day is Boaz. Um, if you read in Ruth, um, Ruth moves with, um, try not to give it all away, but Ruth moves with <laughs> Naomi into this land and, and Ruth is the only one that can, that can find them food and, and be able to sustain them by her work. Um, and Boaz sees her chesed for Naomi and sees her acceptance of Naomi's life as her own life. And Boaz gives Ruth this incredible protection. If you read um, in, in uh, Ruth 2 and Ruth 3, you see this, this man who is this owner of this land who, who recognizes her and recognizes what she's doing for Naomi because um, her reputation has preceded her in this respect. Um, and so Boaz puts himself on the line to protect Ruth and therefore protect Naomi as well. And that's the work of the church. That is supposed to be the work of the church. We are supposed to be hospitable, which, which in, in, in its, in its most base form is the word hospital, right? Mm -hmm. It's people come to be healed. And there are people who are working at the hospital, who are a part of the hospital system, whose job it is to heal and to protect until the person is safe again and then it continues on. And that's that's what the church is supposed to be, a place of healing and protection and safety um, because we accept one another because of Christ-centered love. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think all of, always about the idea of making a space for, of, of setting something up for, which is what we think about when we think about hospitality is things like place settings and menus and things like that. And if you, if you translate that kind of as a metaphor, it is what we're talking about. It's, it's truly making a space for all of someone and showing, because the best hospitality, I, I don't know if you've ever been to one of those, you know, um, showers or parties where the hostess seems to have picked a different sort of gift for each person or has set something different for each person. And it shows how well um, the host or hostess knows them. And so it, that is so much of what hospitality for us is about is, is, is letting people know that we want to know all of who they are and we care about all of who they are, that we are accepting of all of who they are, but we also deeply want to, to be invested and involved in their thriving and their flourishing for all of who they are, to grow into all of who they are, to, to know their gifts and to, to find, um, to truly make space for them, um, which is at its best, very personal and, and, and not superficial. Um, and so taking that concept to its fullest, fullest degree. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's each of us being our own hospitality team, <laughs> mm -hmm. not just a hospitality yeah. team, but being I am the hospitality team for whoever comes into my pew or my classroom or is serving next to me at Habitat that that I I am an open space for you because in valuing you I understand myself better mm -hmm. which leads us to community which is why also I I got really like about 10 or 12 years ago people were people were moving the values and just say them in all different order. And I found myself going, uh, that's no, it, that's not the order. And I was like, am I just being like 
you know, very particular <laughs> and it, no, I'm not. It's because I see this as a progression of discipleship. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they have to move in this order because I think our hearts towards people move in this order. Um, so Christ-centered love is a progressive progresses us to acceptance, which progresses us to, to hospitality, which then builds the kind of community that the church is supposed to be the kingdom of God kind of community where, where we are engaging with one another, where there's sacred space for everyone, where there's healing and wholeness that is happens with one another, not just between us and God, but this communal aspect um, where everyone's voice matters, where your experience, of God is teaching me about who God is and vice versa, because we have this, this hospitable, accepting understanding of one another, then we truly, truly value this authentic community um, that is a safe space of belonging for everyone, where we grow together. We not only as a, as a people, but we grow in our understanding of our discipleship with God. Yeah. Yeah. If you've done acceptance and hospitality, you kind of have to then <laughs> be ready yeah. to do community. It's it's like the acceptance and hospitality are, 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 they're not surface level, but they're the surface level version of community, you know, to be able to say, I, you, you are accepted here. I care deeply about you. Well, community is the, the doing of that. Okay. If I, if I, if I have cared deeply um, about knowing you and making space for you, then what happens when when, when we are together in that space. Um, and that, that is how that progression looks to me a lot of times, um, to, to be able to recognize that part of, of that work is, I, I always say, you know, rubbing up against each other. And that sounds weird sometimes, but it's, it's that, like that friction that happens when, when different people who are all accepted in one space get together, because even people with whom I share a lot of opinions and values, there are differences. And so what community does is it lets us come together amongst those. Um, and we grow in a different way. We have to, to grow and, and transform and change, um, because that's what it that's what being with people does. If you look at Jesus example, the first thing Jesus does when his ministry starts, Jesus, God incarnate, gathers a group of people to be part of his posse, right? He even knows that in order to do this work, he's got to have people around him with him. Um, challenging him, questioning him, um, being able to to force him to articulate himself even better and and to be able to see himself in a different way. Um, so this idea of independence, this idea of, you know, being able to to do it on my own and not needing anybody else um, isn't biblical. It's not what Jesus models for us as what it means to be a Christian, a Christ follower. It means that we have to allow ourselves into the vulnerability that is community. So. Well, and that's what we find at the end of Ruth is that, you know, Ruth and Boaz get married, but, but they become then this bigger community that brings together all these genealogies and all these histories and all these traditions that then that weave the good and the bad too. Um, They become the genealogy for Jesus. Um, And it's through them that, that, that we get to David and Jesus and, and his lineage that's lined out in Matthew. Um, They are a part of the story and there's a power in that um, relationship because the community is so important that we're, we're, we're interdependent upon one another. Um, and it brings other people into our orbits, which again, progresses us to deeper discipleship which is the next core value. Um, Because if I'm in that kind of community that you're talking about, where that's just embedded in Christ-centered love and expressed through this acceptance and hospitality that drew me into a group of people where we're sharing life, where we're healing and hope is happening between us, where our differences are valued um, because we're learning, it's challenging my understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It is, there are things, Melissa, that you teach me that make me a better student of Jesus. Um, whether it's because I, I'm practicing new disciplines, I'm seeing a new understanding of God. Like I, I get a new picture of God I didn't have before through your experience. 
Um, I see this especially when we're in um, community with with people who are racially and ethnically and economically and religiously different than our backgrounds. Yeah, like I I understand uh, abuela faith deeper because of my relationship um, with Liz and her heritage and what she has taught me and what I've read from theologians. You know, I understand things differently by being in relationship and community with Jeremy um, and, and reading black theologians um, and their stories that under, that helps me see a different facet of God, which makes me a strong, I'm not going to say a better disciple because it's not a competition. Um, but a stronger disciple. Yeah. Well, and and those are the the moments where again, doesn't necessarily always feel good. I I often like my little, you know, corner of the universe and and what I have understood and my experience, but when I encounter someone else, um we are so our culture teaches us to fear difference. Um, and, and, and I don't even necessarily mean in, in there are, there are, you know, racism and sexism and all of that embedded. I'm just even talking about a different opinion about something, um, much less those sort of deeper pieces, but, but there is, there is this culture of, of being afraid if someone doesn't have the same understandings of the world as you do. And, um, you know, we know in sort of faith formation theory, one of the things that we see in, in deeply, deeply mature people in faith is they don't have that. They don't, they don't find themselves threatened by difference and they don't find themselves threatened by new ideas. Um, we actually just read with our, our 50 North, um, book group, um, on Wednesdays, we read a, a book called the book of joy, um, which is a, a book that is the archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama spent a week together talking about faith and life and joy and how they find that. And one of the things that the the group commented on was just how how much they um, had in common, how much they found in common, how much they respected one another, while at the same time still being so deeply rooted as as top tier leaders in both of their religious traditions, completely different religious traditions. Um, but there was this connection point and, and they, they found just such a friendship and such a connection and, and were able to articulate how they each and each of their different traditions um, by knowing one another were able to shape how they engaged their own. And, and, that is just something that I don't think comes easily. It's not something that most of us are taught, and it's certainly not what's modeled in our popular culture, um, in our political systems, in our families a lot of times. And and that's where this, this combination of community into discipleship, like that is what discipleship is, is allowing yourself um, to go into uncomfortable spaces and have to hear experiences that are different than yours, whether that's a different interpretation of scripture or whether that's an entirely different cultural experience, racial experience, ethnic experience. Um, mm -hmm. those are, those are things that are, are, are designed to, to help transform us, um, and not to negate anything that we're grounded in, <laughs> but to bring and it, it to understand where, it. Yeah. That's where it becomes our superpower because mm -hmm. it's, it's, not negating anything it's it's broadening it which then lets me go into the culture and into the world and have conversations or be able to sit in discomfort and sit in tension and feel centered and feel grounded because i've done the practice in the safety of the community of, of faith yeah like when i practice I get really excited about this. Um, when, when we're just in echo chambers and everyone thinks the same way in the church, and then we go out into the world, we haven't practiced our faith. We've right. just reiterated the same thing to one another, which doesn't help us become a witness in the world. Because in the world, we're going to be up against things that are going to push and challenge and pick and 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 call us forth and if we haven't practiced that work with people that we know and love yep. who accept us and who are hospitable to us if we haven't practiced it there there's no that's why we get out into the world and the church has a horrible reputation is because yep. we don't know how to do it because we didn't practice it in the church yep there i'm done i'm off my soapbox now. <laughs> Well, there's, there's the, there's the harm that's been done by not practicing it. And then there's the whole other end of the spectrum where we avoid it altogether. 
And, right. and that's where the church gives us the space to do that practice um, so that right. we don't become avoidant, so that we don't um, disengage because we are called to be um, in of the, in the world, right? We are called to be part of mm. our communities and engage. Um, it's right. not getting away from everything and avoiding the hard conversations and avoiding, you know, all of the landmines we know that are out there. It's, it's, discipleship is gaining the ability to engage in a way um, that is constructive and transformative for you and for others and ultimately for the world. Yeah. I mean, they were disciples of Jesus who followed him everywhere in the world. They went to the temple when they would need to go to temple, but their work and their ministry and their study of Jesus was studying Jesus in the world. Yeah. On on the road, in the middle of the community, in the middle of the culture, up and against what was what was going on in the world, and you know that's why anti racism is a is a matter of discipleship, <laughs> um, because it pushes me, it challenges me, and then I have to practice it in the world, which is where discipleship is supposed to be practiced, which leads us to service because yes. our discipleship is not meant just to be in the, in the sanctuary, in the spaces of, of, well, I don't believe there's differences between sacred and profane, but in the, in the holy walls, it's supposed to be lived out in service in the world. And that's if that's personal holiness and social holiness, this is these core values live into John Wesley's call that, you know, personal holiness and social holiness being two wings of a bird without one, if one is broken or one is weak, the bird just goes around in circles and can't fly. Um, and that's what makes us whole is that we then take that discipleship and it has to be lived out in service using our spiritual gifts, using our resources, serving one another, um, and serving in not only ways of mercy, but wor works of justice as well. Um, yeah. One of the centerpieces of the partnership class that we do now um, is is starting. And it's it's something that was long before these core values were written on, on paper. But the first time there was a building built here on St. Luke's campus um, is where our youth center is now. And if you look outside the windows um, behind the youth center, or if you look at it from the, the street, you're going to see a cross. And the very first cross that was placed in a building at St. Luke's was placed on the outside of the building for exactly what you just said, What, which is that we we are looking at what Jesus is doing in the world. Now, there are important things that happen within the walls of the church because that's where we yeah. do some of that, 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 that dress rehearsal work, right? Where we get to wrestle with each other and, 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 you know, do things that, that try, try things on, try things out and, and see how to have these conversations. Um, we, we are able to pray for one another and care for one another and engage in worship and loving God. But all of that, the whole point of it is for meeting Jesus out there. Um, and I, I always think of, of when I think about that cross, you know, I think of it as kind of like, cause you, you can see it sometimes depending on how you leave, um, church is it's kind of Jesus like going, okay, I see you're, you're doing worship. That's good. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting for you when you get out to go do the thing. Um, and so, so that is one of those symbols that, that is part of who we have always been. Um, and so when we think about service, it's, it's not just about volunteering at church, please do. We need you to, that is absolutely part of it, but it's, it's more than that too. It's wanting to make sure that that also doesn't just check a box for you. And then you don't think about, um, what it means to be a disciple any other time of the week, um, to be able to, to say that, you know, I, I always say that, you know, you, you as a person walk a path, engage with people, have experiences, are in spaces and a combination of those things that literally no other person has. So there may be other people in your office. There may be other people at your school. There may be other people, you know, in your home, but no one else is walking that combination of places with the kind of um, personhood that you bring into any of those spaces. There is a uniqueness to you and the influence and the opportunities that you have. And part of that discipleship leading into service is making sure that you don't squander those opportunities, that, that you, you take advantage of them. Um, in a way to to meet Jesus in all of those places, because it's on all of those places. If you envision a cross there too, Jesus is waiting for you to show up because um, he's right. already started working. Right. 
and 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 I I I love the fact that you use, we haven't used that in a while. The the work here is dress rehearsal. Yeah. For us to go enter the stage. Yeah. World and to enter the stage of the world as with Jesus as the protagonist and us as the supporting actors. Um, that's the whole point yeah. that God has written this incredible play and that's what we're a part of. And, and, and so, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's the hermeneutic of performing the, the story God has given, God has written for us, letting, letting Christ be the, the, the protagonist and, and we, we serve in the world as his supporting characters. Mm -hmm. So I love our core values. I have often said, I don't think I can go to another church because <laughs> I, if I were to oh, put it this way, let me put it this way, because that's not my choice. But if I were to not be a pastor appointed to a church and I got to choose where I went to church, these are the core values I would choose to align myself with. Um, because to me, they are the gospel incarnate in every way, shape or form. They are the love story from Genesis to Revelation. Um, they're the life of Christ. Um, they're the theology of who Wesley is. Um, and uh, they make a difference in the world. I think St. Luke's and the difference it makes is because we live out these core values um, as action. So yep. I'm super, super excited um, to be preaching about them and that, and for people to embrace them as their superpowers. Yep. So, so here's what we are hoping you will do, St. Lucas. One of the things that you're going to hear about in the next few weeks, um, and you probably have before, but um, is we want you to be sure that you have taken our Lead Your Life inventory. Um, it is a chance for you to get a little bit deeper into what sort of the nuanced versions of your superpowers are. What are your spiritual gifts? What is the style that God has given you? What is the, what are the the skills that you have, again, that uniquely you bring to this work um, so that you can figure out what that looks like in your life at St. Luke's, any of those spaces? Because one of the things that I think is important um, and for you to have conversations in your life together groups or whatever small group you're a part of or with friends and family, when you look at these core values, we're all called to embody all of them. But I think a lot of us find ourselves more equipped for different ones, right? Maybe you're someone who is a great front door for St. Luke's because you embody that un understanding of acceptance so deeply. Maybe you're someone who loves teaching and challenging people. And so discipleship is the place that you feel the most called. Um, maybe you want to help people get their hands dirty with service. I don't know. But probably one of these is where you find yourself, not which one you want to embody the most, but where you find yourself most equipped to lead. Um, and so, so that um, inventory is a way to start to kind of um, figure that out. I am always glad to have that conversation. Any of our pastors or staff would be able to, um, because when we think about our values, they are, again, they're no good if they're just sitting on our website or in paper, on paper somewhere. They are all about being lived out um, as our actual living superpowers. And so for you to figure out what, which superhero are you? What are, what superhero are you? Um and, and where your particular calling is within all of this is going to be the challenge for you and your groups and for all of us as St. Lucas to figure out together over the next um, few weeks and ongoing as what it means to be a community. Pastor Jen, you so got we want to, Yeah, we want you to read the book of Ruth and we want you to read um, the book of Esther. Um, so we're going to I use these two women and the people in their stories to talk about our superpowers. And we're going to kind of hone in on that. And then of course, Vacation Bible School is going to have um, in the middle of it on community day, we're going to be ha having a vacation Bible school celebration at 10 o'clock in the sanctuary. Um, and then at 930, we're going to be having um, a worship service in contemporary that's uh, about Juneteenth and what does community look like there. And so we hope that you'll be here for each of the Sundays that you will um, read along with us and um, we're excited about it great way to kick off the summer awesome we'll see you on sunday st lucas